Hello, my name is Sean Mitchell and I'm a London Blue Badge Guide with a specialist interest in London's historical Russian connections. One of the most interesting figures um, of the Russian emigres who came here to London is a man called Alexander Herzen. Alexander Herzen arrived in London in 1852 and he came because he was seeking refuge from the world of radicals and revolutionaries um, at, uh, at the centre of which he'd been on the continent. He had witnessed the uh, 1848 revolution in Paris and become highly disillusioned with the aftermath of that when he realised that this wasn't going to be the socialist revolution that he dreamed of, but rather turned into a, a bourgeois, um, rather conservative revolution that um, put the middle classes in charge and repressed any of the working class movements that he was such an adherent of. Um, he felt politically disillusioned and this political disillusionment mixed with personal tragedy and ultimately brought him to London. The personal tragedy was that as a, as a radical stroke revolutionary, Herzen believed um, in free love and he and his wife um, adhered to this principle in theory but um, in the um, in the 1850s um, his uh, his wife started to practice this um, in reality and not just in theory when she started an affair with a young german poet uh, from the romantic revolutionary circles called georg herwig Herzen was absolutely devastated by um, this affair. As I said, he found it easier to adhere to the theoretical principle than the practical um, reality. But after a period of time, um, they were reconciled and uh, his wife um, uh, ended her affair with Herwig. Um, but the tragedy for Herzen didn't end there because he lo then lost his mother and one of his children in a ferry accident um, where a ferry sank off the south coast of France and both his mother and um, his, uh, his disabled child were drowned and soon after that his uh, wife with whom he'd been reconciled um, uh, died uh, shortly after giving birth to Herzen's child and then the child itself died. So Herzen came to London in 1852, as I say, seeking refuge. He, he was alienated from the revolutionary circles, from the scandal around his personal life, but also his sense of political disillusionment, disillusionment with the results of the 1848 Paris Revolution. And he, after a brief uh, sojourn uh, in the in Morley's Hotel that used to stand on Trafalgar Square on the site of South Africa House and then uh, in Spring Gardens on the other side where the, uh, the British Council is. He, he then um, took, a, took a house, a terraced house in Barrow Hill Place uh, right next to Primrose Hill. Now the significance of Primrose Hill in 1852 was that it was right on the edge of London and that was the whole point. Herzen was trying to get away from um, the uh, revolutionary circles because even in London he was such a famous character in that um, in, in the revolutionary community that uh, if he'd have lived in central London he would have be, been expected to participate in um, all sorts of uh, campaigns and meetings etc but Herzen wanted to get away he was um, alienated as I say on a personal and on a political level um, but it did lead to um, one of the, um, the, the great works of Russian literature because in Barrow Hill Place, um, where um, this film will continue, the, we will be making a section of this film in Barrow Hill Place on the site where he lived, he started his um, famous autobiography, translated into English as um, My, My Past and Thoughts. And that, of course, is one of the great classics of Russian literature, along with uh, war and peace and crime and punishment but tragically like Herzen himself it is highly neglected if not unknown in the West um, and uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the great tragedy of Herzen in his day he was an extremely famous figure he was one of the, um, 
the, well, the top people, one of the most respected figures in the revolutionary movement that settled in London in the 1850s when they fled from uh, the failed revolutions of 1858. Um, he was much more famous than Karl Marx, um, for example. Um, but uh, he, um, in, in that time, he, um, he, as I said, first of all, he was alienated from what was going on. But then he, he was a very energetic and dynamic man and couldn't stay uh, disconnected from um, the revolutionary world for very long. And he decided in 1853 to open a free Russian press. Um, the press in Russia um, was strictly controlled by the Tsarist authorities. Everything was censored. Um, but of course, if Herzen was able to uh, start publishing in Russian, um, in London, he would be able to publish freely. And first of all, he uh, set up his press, he bought the press in Paris, had it shipped over, he was a rich man, so he, was, he had, the, had the financial um, ability to do these kind of things, and he set it up in the um, headquarters of uh, uh, Democratic Poland, which was a Polish um, revolutionary organisation which also produced publications. And they were based on Regent Square, which is just the other side of this park here. The building where they were located has gone now. It was destroyed in the Second World War and was replaced by the Rodmel um, Council estate. Um, the problem with the Regent Square location was that um, the Polish uh, leaseholder, the member of Democratic Poland who was the leaseholder, was having uh, problems keeping up with his lease payments towards the end of um, 18, um, 1850, uh, 1854 and um, Herzen was worried that his press might be confiscated um, by the bailiffs so he then moved over to uh, Judd Street which is the street that is running behind me just behind um, this park here in um, Bloomsbury. Um, now the reason we know these exact, uh, the exact locations of these presses is because um, a research project was started in 2011. It was a collaboration between um, Dr. Sarah J. Young of the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College London and um, the local uh, residents association in this area of Bloomsbury, the Marchmont Association. Um, and, uh, well, most, most credit must go to um, their chair, a man called Ricky De Freitas, who worked with Sarah J. Young to pin down the, the exact locations of the presses. Um, I was also involved in that research project, but in, in a minor way. Um, and it all culminated uh, ultimately in the Marchmont Association installing a, a plaque to commemorate the site where Herzen moved from Regent Square to the first independent site of the Free Russian Press, which was located at 61 Judd Street, which is over here. It's that building uh, on the street running behind me and um, you can see there that there's a, uh, a blue plaque put up by the Marchmont Association to commemorate the fact that the press was there from 1854 to 1856. Um, the, uh, the whole historical background um, to this can, uh, can be read about on Sarah's excellent website, Sarah J. Young, Russians in London. Uh, there's a section on Herzen himself and also on the Free Russian Press where all the details of the research um, can, be, um, uh, can be read about. And, um, but what I'm interested in is to uh, relate my own um, uh, personal element and connection with this story now, in that um, as a London Blue Badge guide and, and um, a great fan of Herzen since I was an undergraduate 25 years ago, I was very excited by all of this because I was hoping to develop a series of guided um, London Blue Badge walks um, that the main focus of which would have been um, the plaque over there, really to raise awareness about Alexander Herzen because as I've said he is a tragically um, neglected 
figure and indeed many people um, don't even know um, the name. But in my opinion, he's not only an important part of uh, Russian emigre history, but he's also an important part of London history. And as I say, I was um, hoping that the, the plaque would stimulate a wave of interest in Herzen, which would translate itself into um, a series of walks. Well, the plaque was installed almost a year ago uh, now, back in June 2013. And um, unfortunately, after that um, interest um, seemed to evaporate and um, the, uh, the, 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 um, well, the, the, the public that I was hoping would be um, uh, interested in ha having the walks didn't materialise. And so what I've decided to do is, well, there are two elements to what I've decided to do. First of all, I was inspired by the original research to then go on and research myself into all of Hertzen's um, uh, ill-defined or undefined locations. I should just explain that. We already uh, know uh, several of the locations in London, the exact locations where Hertz and I either lived or was connected with, but there are a number of them that the um, existing historiography only, um, de uh, only defined in terms of the general area. Well, I have spent six months researching um, through the archives, the, um, the wet, the, um, uh, the London Metropolitan Archives and archives like those of Wandsworth, um, the Wandsworth Library Service, and I've identified um, all of the, the most important um, locations associated with Hertzen that were not defined, and I have found out the exact locations. So the, the practical remit for this film is in order to, uh, to show you those um, locations. We are going to travel around London with this film and film um, those locations. But in the process, I want to tell you the story of Hertzen's life in London, because the, uh, the thing about Hertzen is the reason I have always been interested in him since I was an undergraduate is because he is an extraordinary figure. He's uh, very different, um, I would say, to many of the other uh, members of the revolutionary movement. And I think the, 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 the sort of key poignant factor the, about Hertzen that, that makes him so extraordinary, so memorable, 150 years, uh, 160 years after um, he uh, arrived in London, is that through his free Russian press, he made a major contribution to the history of Russia and the history of the world in the sense that he um, uh, contributed and made a major contribution to the abolition of serfdom. It was because people were reading his journals. Um, um, the, uh, first of all, his journal, um, uh, The Polar Star, that he produced um, uh, on, the, on the House 61 Judd Street, and then uh, The Bell, that he produced actually on the site over here. The, the building has now um, gone, but on this site, on the corner of this park, was where he was producing the, uh, the bell, and the bell was being um, smuggled into Russia in very large numbers and being read by the great and the good in Russia and had a major influence on the final decision of the Tsar and his ministers to abolish serfdom in um, 1861. But what makes Herzen truly great, in my opinion, is that he wasn't just satisfied with the abolition of serfdom. He wanted to transform Russian society in a much more radical way. He had even greater ideals than uh, the freeing of the serfs. And this film is going to share the locations that I've identified through my research, but also tell the very poignant and ultimately rather tragic story of Herzen's ideals and his uh, disillusionment or failure to achieve those wider ideals for the transformation of Russia. Thank you very much. Hello, and we're now on Prince Albert Road, um, right on the, uh, the northern edge of Regent's Park, next to Primrose Hill. And the reason we're here is because there used to be a terrace of houses running along here called Barrow Hill Place. And number two was where Alexander Herzen lived when he first came to London in 1852. 
As I said on the previous part of my film, he wanted to get away from all the revolutionary community, the people that he, know, he knew and had mixed with when he was in, in France. So he deliberately chose to uh, move out here because at that point, in the mid 19th century, the northern edge of Regent's Park here next to Primrose Hill was in fact the very edge of London. So he was tucked away, he was secluded, he was isolated from the wider world. Um, all the old terraced houses along here have now gone and been replaced by these flats that have been built in the 1930s, 50s and uh, 60s. Um, but Wells Rise over here did exist in Hertz, Hertzen's time and it was just called Wells Road in, tho in those days. And from Wells Rise I was able to determine exactly where number two Barrow Hill Place, where Hertzen lived, was located. And in fact, it was located exactly where the entrance is to these flats over here. This is Consort House, named again after Prince Albert, rather appropriate, um, since uh, he, of course, was uh, the consort at the time that uh, Alexander Hertzen arrived here. So, even though all the properties have changed along here, the road structure is the same, and from the Ordnance Survey map of 1870, I was able to determine exactly where it was. And if you look over to that side, over on the corner of Primrose Hill, you can see this little villa on the corner there. That also would have been there uh, in Hertzen's time. And um, from that, I was able to determine exactly uh, where the house would have been. And as I say, it was on the site of the, um, of the entrance to, um, to this building. So what we're looking at here is really one of the most important sites, historical sites of Russian literature, because as I said in the first part of this film, uh, Herzen started his famous autobiography, My Past and Thoughts, into Barrow Hill Place. He um, was reflecting on his life, he thought life was over, and actually started to write the part dealing with his life in England, first of all. And then he went back through uh, his whole life to make it one of the most famous pieces of Russian literature. But as we know, of course, it wasn't the end of his life because um, although he may have been very depressed and uh, wanting to seek refuge when he came here in November 1852, he soon got a sense of, uh, of energy and uh, his sense of dynamism and a desire to re-engage with the world returned to him. And he, in the following year, he opened the Free Russian Press, the first free Russian press in history, which would lead on to great things and, in fact, would be the, uh, the greatest period of Herzen's life. And we will, at our next bit of this film, we will look at uh, one of the places he lived later on where he was already engaged in some of the arguments and some of the, the issues that emerged out of creating this free Russian press that made him famous in Russia, as well as famous amongst the revolutionary community that were living here in London in the 1850s. Thank you. Hello, and today we're on Fleet Street in central London to talk about Alexander Herzen's relationship with English radicalism. It's one of the nostrums of Herzen studies that Alexander Herzen didn't really have any kind of sustain, sustained, substantial relationship with English radicalism or English radicals. However, in a recent book by a French scholar called Françoise Kunker, this view was exploded. In her 2011 book, Alexander Herzen and the Free Russian Press, 
Kunker maintains the position that in fact Herzen not only had substantial working collaborations with English radicals but also some close sustained friendships with some English radicals throughout the period of his life here in London. Now the view that Herzen remained isolated from English radical life in fact comes from the big beasts of Herzen studies, namely E. H. Carr and the great Isaiah Berlin. And their position on this, that Herzen uh, remained isolated from English radical life, refers not only to the period when he um, secreted himself away in Primrose Hill, but throughout the period of his life in London. But that view, or their view, comes from the fact that they focused on Herzen's great memoir, My Past and Thoughts, in order to draw that conclusion. And indeed, if you just focus on that as the source, anybody would draw the conclusion that Herzen remained isolated from English radical life. But what Kunker did was to focus on Herzen's correspondence. And the picture that emerges from the correspondence is that, in fact, Herzen did have an ongoing relationship throughout the whole of the 12 years that he was here in London with our notable English radicals. And the two most outstanding figures in that theme are the MP, Joseph Cowan, and Joseph Cowan uh, supported Herzen in a number of different ways. But uh, probably the most significant way was that Cowan's family had a business up in Newcastle upon, Ta uh, up in Newcastle upon Tyne making bricks. And they exported these bricks. And Cowan put the export network of his family business at Herzen's service in order to smuggle publications of the Free Russian Press into Russia. The other notable figure in the, on this theme is W.J. Linton. And W.J. Linton was an engraver and a radical newspaper editor who famously produced that image that formed the frontispiece of Herzen's journal, The Polar Star. And Herzen's uh, scholars and those who studied Herzen will surely be familiar with this image of five of the uh, Decemberists in a profile shot on the cover of that journal. The five Decemberists, of course, who were hanged in 1826 for their participation in the Decemberist uprising. It is through W.J. Linton that Herzen was introduced to the place that we're going to talk about here on Fleet Street. The name of that organisation was the Political Exchange. And in order to explain what the Political Exchange was, I now need to turn my attention to a man called George Holyoke. OK, so George Holyoke was a militant atheist who, having just served a prison sentence for criticising the Christian church, decided to continue his radical activities in a slightly different form by opening a bookshop. He opened a bookshop here on Fleet Street in 1853 as a publishing centre and a distribution centre for radical publications of all different kinds. Now, what Holyoke found was very soon after opening his bookshop, he had all the radicals, the English radicals and the foreign emigre radicals of London coming and buying his books. But what they also wanted was an opportunity and a forum in which to discuss the radical ideas that they were reading about. So for that reason, Holyoke decided to open his parlour on the first floor of the same house where the bookshop was located as a forum for as a forum for discussion. And very quickly, this forum became famous and became known as the political exchange. And indeed, it attracted radicals from all over London and people who were passing through London 
at the time uh, and became so notorious that it was known as the new Cato Street or even the place where all the stormy petrels of Europe were gathering. George Hollyoaks Bookshop was opened at 147 Fleet Street and 147 Fleet Street is still in the same location that it is today although the building has been replaced and now it is occupied by the a branch of the Paul French bakery chain that we can see over here and although the building has been replaced as I say if you can imagine that the first floor was the place where the political exchange met and if you look to the house just to the right there that is an original uh, house from the uh, 19th century and would have looked exactly the same as the house that Holyoke used for his bookshop and for the political exchange. And William J. Linton introduced Hertzen to a wide circle of British radicals and journalists in this organisation. Hello and today we're at St Mary's Church near Clapham Common Underground Station. In the great year of revolutions, 1848, there was a little revolution here in the Christian community of Clapham when a very small, obscure, monastic Catholic sect, the Redemptorists, set up a monastic house here on this site on what is the, the modern Clapham Park Road. The background to this decision was, of course, um, in the broad dimension, the 1829 Catholic Emancipation Act, which allowed Roman Catholics to practice their faith openly again for the first time since the English Reformation. The specific background to the Redemptorist community here in Clapham was that in the 1840s there was a, a huge influx of Irish Catholics coming to Britain, mainly to the cities, to escape the terrible potato famine in the west of Ireland and the Catholic church authorities suddenly realised that they just didn't have enough parishes to meet the needs of that communion. Now because the emancipation had only taken place some 20 years before there wasn't as it were the, uh, the church infrastructure to um, establish church infrastructure to create a parish here in uh, what was a village to the southwest of London at that time um, in Clapham. So the, uh, the church authorities turned as I say to this very small obscure monastic sect, the Redemptorists, to come here. And they arrived, uh, three of them, three uh, monastic uh, brothers, arrived at a house that was on the site of this transept, of a uh, south transept of St Mary's Church in 1848 and started their monastic community. Now, I said that this was a little revolution in the Christian community. And the reason I use that phrase is because of the religious character of Clapham. Uh, Clapham was uh, a village that has a page in world history because of the famous Clapham sect. The Clapham sect were that group of very devout evangelical Anglicans who laboured tirelessly for 30 years for the abolition of African slavery in the British Empire. Outstanding figures like William Wilberforce, Zachary Macaulay and Henry Thornton lived around Clapham Common, which is not far from where we're standing now, and of course worshipped in their own Anglican Church of Holy Trinity, which still stands on Clapham Common. It was actually quite an ironic um, decision that the Redemptorists uh, decided to come here to Clapham because of this uh, established religious character of the Clapham area due to the work of the Clapham sect. And not only was it ironic that they came to this particular uh, area, but in fact the house that the three uh, Redemptorist brothers moved into on the site here had actually been built by the Thornton family, whose famous son Henry was one of the leading figures of the Clapham sect. 
And in fact, the previous tenant of the house had been a man called John Shaw, or Lord Tainmouth, who not only was a leading member of the Clapham sect, but was the first president of the British Bible Society, which was committed to the militant dissemination of the evangelical Anglican word throughout the peoples of the British Empire. This connection with Lord Tainmouth and the British Bible Society reminds us of the aspect of the Clapham sect that is often overlooked by people who are aware, of course, of that very important history of the abolition of slavery. In that the abolition of slavery for the members of the Clapham sect was in fact just one aspect of a wider programme of missionary conversion of the peoples of the British Empire. What the people like William Wilberforce and Zachary Macaulay and Henry Thornton believed was that they needed to uh, take Africans out of slavery as a preliminary measure to converting them to their own evangelical Anglicanism. And this wasn't just a religious measure, it was actually designed to uh, inculcate um, English or Anglican, uh, Christian and commercial values and turn Africa really into an extension of the values of the Clapham sect um, and the rest of the empire for that matter because they turned their attention to India soon after um, the uh, abolition of slavery, um, in African slavery in, in the Caribbean and were so ambitious that they actually believed that they could convert uh, Muslims and Hindus to Anglicanism. And it's against this background that the Redemptorist Fathers arrived here, as I said, in 1848. And of course they were very aware of the militant Anglican character of, uh, of Clapham. And it's for that reason that when they opened the parish church here of St Mary's in 1851, the opening ceremony actually took place at five o'clock in the morning because they were very nervous about having a hostile reaction from the local Anglican community. In the event, the, uh, the day passed off successfully, although at one point the police did have to be called in order to disperse a hostile crowd who had formed outside the area of the monastic foundation. Their problems weren't quite over, even at that point, because uh, when the, uh, the bells, the peal of bells, were put into the church when it was finished in 1851, one of the, the neighbours of the Redemptorists here in, um, on what is now Clapham Park Road went to court to take out an injunction against them ringing those bells. And in fact, the bells were installed in 1851, but they weren't rung until 1864, when that anti-Catholic neighbour finally died. But the parish went on to be very successful. Um, this uh, new Catholic parish in, in the southwest, or to the southwest of uh, London. And one of the reasons for that success is not least because of the quality of the architecture here of this, of this St Mary's Church. St Mary's Church was designed by an architect called William Wardle, who is not a well-known name, but he was the pupil of someone who was extremely well-known, namely Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin. Pugin was, of course, the architect who started scholarly Gothic revival in this country. And the significance of Pugin is that he didn't just see architecture in aesthetic terms, but in moral terms. He believed that the Gothic revival was an expression of a more uh, moral, medieval, traditional world that had been destroyed by industrial and commercial culture in mid 19th century Britain. And so his buildings were an expression of a desire to turn, return to a romantic traditional past. And his pupil William Wardle picked that up in this building by using what we can see, the cladding on the, on the uh, tower and uh, the steeple of the church, this rough hewn 
Kentish ragstone. And although it can't be seen because of the repair work that's going on on the spire, the spire is what's known as a broached spire, where the uh, steeple doesn't meet up with the corners of the tower directly, but is connected by four skirting fins. These are not just architectural conceits, they're expression, expressions of values, of romantic, Catholic, medievalist values that Pugin held and certainly transmitted to his pupil. And it's because of these features that this church is uh, not only a grade two star listed building, but was assessed by the great architectural historian Nicholas Pevsner as one of the best churches in South London. The original house that the three Redemptorist brothers moved into was on the site of the south transept, the current south transept of St Mary's Church. And this uh, red brick L-shaped uh, building um, that we can see here, which is in fact the purpose-built monastic residence. Um, these were both built at the beginning of the 1890s and they were built by the famous architect uh, J.R. Bentley, uh, sorry, J.F. Bentley, I should say, um, who is famous for having built the Roman Catholic Cathedral uh, in Westminster on Victoria Street. And J.F. Bentley was employed on this project not only um, because he happened to be a local, he lived just on the other side of Clapham Common in Clapham Common Old Town, but also because he shared the same philosophy as Pugin. The, the spirit of Pugin was kept alive in these developments of the Redemptorist monastic complex here in Clapham. In that these buildings, uh, especially the, uh, the, the monastic residence, um, is in what's known as an arts and crafts Gothic style, which again is a style that reflects this idea of returning to a pre-industrial, pre-commercial, medieval, romantic uh, past. And Bentley himself was very much committed um, to that to philosophy and wanted to extend it. And what is interesting is that not only does the architecture here reflect these ideas of uh, a pre-industrial, pre-commercial, um, romantic medievalist uh, past that was, of course, so, mu uh, so much the antithesis of the, the views of the Clapham sect with their belief in commerce and empire. But those same views were reflected in one of the original founding fathers of the Redemptorist Monastery here, a man called Vladimir Pichirin. Vladimir Pichirin was a Russian who had been at Moscow University in the 1830s with the main subject of our film, Alexander Herzen. So Herzen uh, never met Pichirin personally, even though they were studying at the university at the same time, but he knew of him because Pichirin had such an amazing reputation. Pichirin was such a brilliant scholar of languages that he was offered the professorship of Greek at Moscow University before he'd even finished his degree. And when he took up that post, within a term, he'd established himself as an outstanding teacher. What is interesting is that there are some parallels uh, between Herzen, uh, Herzen's and uh, Pichirin's life in that while they were at Moscow University, both of them were idealists dreaming about a future ideal society in, in Russia. And they were reading uh, secretly, uh, because it was illegal, French utopian socialist literature. But uh, subsequently, they went down very different paths. Pichirin, at the end of that very first, very successful term of teaching as the uh, professor of Greek, tendered his resignation to the university, packed his bags, and left Russia and went into exile for the rest of his life, rather like Herzen did. Pichirin left a letter saying, quote unquote, that he couldn't bear to live in a country where he couldn't find any imprint of the creator. 
He then turned up in Western Europe and was living in a state of destitution for some four years before he ultimately converted to Catholicism and joined the Redemptorist Order and came to be here in Clapham. Now Alexander Herzen, as we know, came to London in 1852 and in the spring of 1853 he heard, to his amazement, that Pacherin was living here in Clapham in St Mary's Redemptorist Monastery. Because of Pacherin's reputation, Herzen was very keen to see him, as he always was keen to meet other members of the Russian intelligentsia during his time living in London. And he arranged to visit Pacherin, and subsequent to that they had a written correspondence for a period of time until it abruptly came to an end and relations were broken off completely. In a moment I will discuss why the relationship between Pichirin and Herzen came to such an abrupt end. But just before that, I think it's worth um, pointing out uh, another theme that is relevant to this story. I said earlier that it was rather ironic that the Redemptorists chose to come here to Clapham since this area was such a militantly evangelical Anglican area. Well, in a way, that theme of irony also touches upon Herzen's visit because the, the next generation of the Clapham sect um, were also based around this, this area and they are most outstandingly represented by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Thomas Babington Macaulay was the son of Zachary Macaulay who grew up at number five, the pavement, just the other side of Clapham High Street. And Babington Macaulay and his generation of evangelical Anglicans or the sons of evangelical Anglicans took the ideas of the Clapham sect a step further and actually made, made, made them a sustained part of British government policy in the empire by turning this theme of, of, of Christian conversion or Anglican uh, missionary conversion into a theme of what they called commerce and Christianity. They had this idea that they could not only um, establish the Anglican Christian faith throughout the peoples of the empire, but that would be combined with their own belief in free trade and commerce. And it was an alternative vision of the world, an alternative vision of society. And as I say, it's most vividly uh, captured in the figure of Thomas Babington Macaulay, of, who of course was also a great historian. He was the great historian high priest of the triumphant British middle classes. Um, but it, the reason I say it's ironic is because of course this was a very different vision of the future ideal society to the one that Herzen had in mind and in fact this bourgeois triumphalism was the antithesis, antithesis of everything that he hoped for. But returning to the encounters between Pichirin and Herzen, after the initial visit uh, where Herzen came here to, to see Pichirin in the house um, that used to stand here on the site of the south transept, the the main patterns of their disagreement were revealed in their correspondence. And that really starts with a letter that Pichirin sent to Herzen in April 1853, where he said that Herzen's vision of the future ideal society was profoundly flawed because he was relying on rationality and philosophy. And as far as Pichirin was concerned, that history had shown that the only real foundation for a good future society would be a religious basis. Well, Herzen responded to that with the refrain that had been part of his thinking at least since 1848, where he said that the, he believed that the Russian people were quote unquote naturally communistic. And what he meant by that, well, of course, was that he believed that the Russian peasant commune would form a basis for creating a federation of agrarian socialist communities 
that would be a model, not just of socialism in Russia, but in the world. He did insist, of course, that the intelligentsia had a role in this, in that they had to go to the Russian peasantry and bring them the benefits of rational education and progressive social development. But he put his faith in the Russian peasant commune, as we know, based on a, uh, a, a progressive, rationalist, philosophical worldview. Pichirin, in turn, responded to this by saying that in many ways Herzen represented the philosophical theme that he feared most about the future of civilization, namely that it was based on a material premises, a premise, and that Herzen represented to him what he called, quote unquote, the tyranny of matter. But Herzen, in turn, responded to this by saying, that he believed Pichirin was the one who was undermining the theme of human freedom by joining a Catholic monastic sect and not giving, as he saw it, people independence of thought. So, unsurprisingly, the Catholic convert monk and the man who was called by Lenin the father of Russian socialism were not able to find common ground for a vision of Russia's future development and a future ideal society. And this visit is significant in another way, of course, because it was an omen of what was to happen in the subsequent years of Herzen's life here in London, in that he would meet many more members of the Russian intelligentsia here. But even though many of those were of an atheistic turn of mind like himself, he was never able to find a basis for a shared vision of Russia's social future. Thank you. Hello, and today we're in Twickenham in the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Gardens. These gardens were developed, as the name suggests, for the Diamond Jubilee celebrations in 2012. Prior to that, there used to be a very popular municipal Lido that stood here where the people of Richmond and Twickenham used to come and relax and, and uh, swim and bathe. Um, but the, uh, what happened was that that Lido was closed down in, the 90, in 1980 because the Richmond upon Thames Borough Council couldn't afford to maintain it. The area was left derelict for some 30 years until they finally redeveloped it into the gardens that we see today. However, for the purposes of our story, we're not interested uh, so much in the gardens or the Lido, but what stood here on the site of the Lido um, before. What stood here before was Richmond House. Richmond House was built in 1816 and was one of the numerous uh, riverside villas that were dotted all along this part of the Thames to the west of London. And of course in their day they used to be surrounded by large areas of open space without any of the uh, housing and commercial development that we see today. And in fact that was the case when Alexander Herzen lived here in Richmond House from 1854 to 1855. Now the, um, the Lido uh, was actually um, preserved, or at least the footprint of the Lido was preserved when these gardens were redeveloped by the council. And we can see the footprint of the Lido here with these concrete lines running along. These were the lanes of the swimming Lido. And the, the ones on the edges here were obviously the perimeter. And if you look over here, you can see the platform of the old diving board where people used to take the plunge into the Lido. And that platform, that diving board, marks the, the northern edge of the Lido. And that is very useful for our purposes because in fact, the footprint of the Lido, the perimeter of the Lido, exactly correlates with the perimeter of Richmond House where Hertzen lived. So this 
even though the house is long gone, we've got this uh, Lido footprint here, which helps to give, give us an idea of the exact space in which the events of Hertzen's life here in Twickenham took place. And the most important event in that period of his life took place on the 2nd of March, 1855. On the 2nd of March, 1855, news came through to Hertzen at Richmond House here on this site that Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, the emperor, had died. This was a source of great elation for Alexander Herzen because as far as he was concerned, Nicholas I had held Russia in a, in a complete state of repression for the 30 years that he'd been on the throne. And this was an opportunity, as far as Herzen, Herzen was concerned, for a new beginning, a new start. It gave him a completely new sense of hope. And the first way that he celebrated that new sense of hope was in a very famous event that again occurred on the same day, the 2nd of March, 1855. He gathered together all the local urchins from here in Twickenham, gave them six pence each and sent them out all over the district shouting, hurrah, hurrah, Tsar Nickel is dead, Tsar Nickel is dead. Hertzen had a very good reason to feel elated by the death of Tsar Nicholas I, not just because it was the passing of the old tyrant, but because he had new hope and optimism for the new Tsar and Emperor, Alexander II. Alexander II was known to be of a much more benign and benevolent temperament than his uh, reactionary and suspicious father. And Herzen himself had actual personal experience of this because when he'd been exiled to Vyadka, he'd met the Tsarevich as he was then in person and the Tsarevich had actually talked to him about the possibility of getting his uh, sentence of exile reduced or possibly um, actually um, squashed. So Herzen felt this great sense of, of hope and that expressed itself in uh, his decision to start a new journal. And rather fortuitously, this coincided with uh, positive uh, circumstances back in Britain itself, because in June 1855, the British government decided to repeal the stamp duty on periodicals. This was done by the, the British government in order to encourage uh, literacy and uh, reading. But for Herzen, this gave him the chance to produce more cheaply and uh, more efficiently uh, a journal in Russian that he, a regular journal in Russian, that he would be smuggling into the country in order to influence the opinion of not just the Tsar, but the general public as well. And it has to be said that this was really the beginning of Herzen exercising a very powerful influence on his country through the Free Russian Press. This was the point where he became famous back in Russia because the Tsar Alexander II was actually reading his journals and uh, along with the, the influence he was having on general Russian public opinion through all his his publications, he made a major contribution to one of the most important events in Russian history, which was the abolition of serfdom in 1861. But not only was um, it, it, in the at the beginning of the uh, the Polar Star uh, Journal, um, the uh, uh, Herzen made an appeal to the Tsar, asking him to repeal serfdom. He said that this is the right thing to do and you should quote, unquote, hurry now. Um, and the general political uh, line of the journal was made very clear on the frontispiece because it had that famous image of the five Decemberists who were hanged after this Decemberist uprising of 1825, which was done by his English friend, and radical collaborator, 
W.J. Linton. It's through the emergence of the Polar Star in 1855 that uh, a new and very important theme uh, emerges in Hertzen's life and Hertzen's work here in London. And it relates to uh, this principle that he had of free speech and insisting that uh, all opinions should be reflected in all of his publications. After his appeal to the Tsar in the very first edition of the Polar Star, there was another appeal to the Russian public, which was to uh, send him their, uh, their own um, manuscripts and writings and poems and, and correspondence that he would publish in the Polar Star because the whole point was he, he wanted to make it clear that this was an organ of free speech, absolutely, um, with no sectarian or political bias. The only thing that he said he wouldn't publish is those uh, documents or materials which supported the, the Russian Tsarist state because, as he put it, he was only going to publish things, quote unquote, written in the spirit of freedom. That appeal was reacted to very quickly and Herzen had the, the very first of the great long line of visitors that he would have over the next few years from Russia visiting him in London. That first visitor was a man called uh, Dr. Piccolini and Piccolini was a Russian on the edge of a, a radical uh, circle back in, uh, back in Russia who came to London with a huge pile of correspondence and manuscripts um, that he'd uh, gathered from his uh, friends and acquaintances back in Russia for Herzen to publish. And what's extraordinary about Piccolini's journey is that it was done when the Crimean War was still going on. So not only was he seen as uh, traveling to an enemy power by the Russian authorities, but when he arrived here in Britain, he was seen as an enemy alien by the British authorities. But that didn't stop him. And he got here and he came to see Herzen in order to hand over his materials. But I think that this theme of uh, the free speech that Herzen was in, insisting on is, um, well, for, firstly, it's unique in the sense that there were many emigre publications produced um, in London and in Western Europe. And Herzen's was unique in the sense that he was the only one who was prepared to uh, open up his pages to all shades of political opinion. All the other emigre journals, certainly in London, had a very clear political line. And I think it's indicative of a deeper philosophical point with Herzen, that he believed that free speech would lead to rational men and women coming to an agreed collective vision of society. This insistence on free speech wasn't in the name of the kind of facile pluralism that um, uh, he experienced when he got to, to the West. Um, he was doing it because he thought that through free, free, free speech, people would actually come together and agree about how to run society in uh, a collective and harmonious way. And the reason I say that this has philosophical significance is because, of course, Herzen was a great champion of the individual, of the personal, and that people shouldn't be in any way uh, dictated to by czars or princes or even by the bourgeois values of Britain that he discovered in the mid-19th century here in London. And in a way, even though Herzen was a very famous representative of the Russian westernizing movement, um, who'd fled to the West because he felt he couldn't uh, develop what he wanted to do in his own country. This theme of moving towards a, a vision of collective harmony, communitarian harmony, we might say, is indicative of his sympathies that are more Russian and Slavophile rather than Western. And as I say, even though he's known as a westernizing 
thinker. I think what we've got here is an expression of what the Russians call sobornost, which means collectivity, social harmony, but a social harmony that is dependent and premised on the free expression of the individual. And in the latter parts of this film, we will see how this very important philosophical theme develops in Herzen, because I think it's what makes him uniquely interesting as a member of the Russian intelligentsia. Thank you very much.